see the lights come up. <laughs> good morning. It is good to have you joining us here for worship today. We also want to welcome those of you who are online. Um, we are glad that you have joined us for worship today. Just a few little brief announcements before we get started as we lift up the name of the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, 
If you are visiting for the first time, we bid you welcome. Um, also, though, um, we have this thing called a Connect card. There are some paper copies in the back, but if you look on the screen, there is a QR code, and you can put your phone up there and take a picture of that. It's also on our bulletin, the QR code is, and um, you can go directly to and sign that and let us know that you're here. If you have any prayer requests, you can put them on there. There's also various other sign-ups um, there on the Connect Card app, so you can go and um, take care of that there. Um, please, if you need to get in contact with us, we have an email office at nschristianchurch.org. You can also check things out on our website, which is nschristianchurch.org. Again, we want to say welcome. We are glad that you have joined us for our time of celebration here today in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand as we begin with a word of prayer? Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you, the creator of this universe, in awe of everything that you have done. But we are especially in awe of the love that you have for us, a love that was willing to send your one and only Son that we might be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life. So, Father, we come to celebrate that day, to celebrate Jesus Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as the body of Christ and lift your name up both in word and in song. We pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
that leads to life. One redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion by his blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is destiny.
today's scripture is Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Amen. You may be seated. You are the word at the beginning. One with God. Glory in creation. Now we 
Let's do this again. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate that. <laughs> Appreciate y'all leading us today. Welcome to Northside, everybody. It's good to have everyone here this morning. And those of you in person, uh, congratulations. Uh, you made it. And you, uh, you know, turned your clocks to the right spot. And hopefully you made it at the right spot. Uh, those of you online, we're glad you're here as well. And uh, we look forward to sharing in this time together. I want everyone to do a little bit of an exercise with me this morning for just a moment, okay? I want you to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Now, some of us might sit there and say, well, that's a great way to, you know, to calm yourself and focus yourself on what is really the worst morning of the entire calendar year. Um, yeah, <laughs> amen, Nora. Yeah. I'm, with you. I'm like, oh, please, coffee, be there for me in the morning. Um, but uh, actually, that's not the reason I had us do that this morning. The reason I had us do that this morning is because we just had all the upholstery and carpet clean in the building, and I love the f- smell of the freshness in this room. And I hope you can smell that freshness as well. I cannot account for the people sitting next to you or even whether you are fresh this morning, but I can account for the fact that the chairs are fresh this morning. And, and that's a good thing. We've gotten in a pattern now, and I think it's a good one, that every year before Easter, we do a, a deep clean of all the carpeted the fabric surfaces in this building from bow to stern. Uh, and so it's a good kind of way to kind of keep maintaining the building. You know, the, the building is getting cleaned a couple of times every week, and we do spot cleaning throughout the year and things, but it's nice to have this one time where we do like a deep clean every February or March, and we have Stanley Steamer come in and they do their thing. But to do that, it also takes a lot of preparation on our part. I mean, think about what you might prepare for when you have Stanley Steamer or if you have the, something like that come, or maybe you do it yourself, and you got to prepare the house for that, right? Uh, and you got to move things around. And, you know, now we're in this, like, 14,000-square-foot building, and there's a lot of carpet in this building, <laughs> a lot of spaces with carpet in this building. And all these loose items on the floor have to you know, get moved to places where there isn't carpet. Every chair, every trash can, every box, every decoration. And you got to make sure every piece of furniture is accessible that you want to get clean. you got to make sure it's where they can get to it. And so Thursday night, we had a group. And of course, we had Celebrate Recovery on Thursday nights. And after, after Celebrate Recovery was done, there was a number of us that were here. And a big shout out to our CR people who stuck around and helped us with everything Thursday night. It was awesome to have all that kind of help and things afterward. But they helped us get everything ready for Stanley Steamer to show up on Friday and do, and do their work. And man, I'll tell you what, you realize how many items are in this space when you endeavor to do something like that. One of the most significant areas affected by cleaning, though, was our offices. Because our offices all have carpet. And then we have a lot of loose things on the floors in our offices, things we had to get out of the way. And so the offices are located back here behind the stage. And... We had to get all this stuff out of our offices. In order to do that, we had to go find a place. We have to have a place that has no carpet to put all of the stuff. Here's a picture of where we put all the stuff. <laughs> That's our workroom behind this wall. <laughs> That's what it looked like by the end of the night on Thursday. And as I saw that, the thought occurred to me. You know, this was, of course, a temporary setup. We didn't, I didn't show you a picture of the maintenance room, so the maintenance room would be another thing. But, but this is sort of like a setup, you know, I, it made me think about our homes that we live in. In our homes, I bet almost every person here in our home, our apartment, wherever we live, we got a space that looks probably something like that. Now, it may not be a room. It might be a drawer. It, it might be an attic, a garage, a shed. It might be a closet, but whatever it is, if it's wherever it is, it is the least presentable and least organized space in our house. And we would be content if no one ever saw it. We'd be content if no one ever had to peek in and look and see. We, if people could go and with their whole lives and never know that part of our house, we would be okay. Many years ago, Robert Boyd Munger wrote a short essay or a little story entitled, My Heart, Christ Home. And he used the image of a home to help the reader imagine what it would be like for, to invite Christ into your life. And it's this little short story. You can read it all in one sitting. As a matter of fact, you can go Google it on, and you can find it for free online. And you can see, uh, you can see what, uh, what the story is. 
But in the story, Jesus comes into this man's home, and which is representative of his heart, of his life. And it's not very dramatic at first when Jesus shows up. All Jesus does when he first walks in, he starts a warm fire. He starts a warm fire in the living room, and that's it. He banishes the cold from the house and brings in the warmth. And then the man turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I want everything here to be yours. Let me show you around. And so the man begins to take Jesus on a tour of his heart, of his home. Of his, of his home. And the first thing they do is they go to the study. And all, on all the shelves in the study are the things the man has consumed and meditated on over the years. And as Jesus enters this room, immediately there's this feeling of embarrassment. Oh, he looks around, you know, he sees all these things. And he himself hadn't really seen all the things in this light before. And he's a little embarrassed that Jesus is seeing all of this. And he asks Jesus for help cleaning it up. And Jesus, without judgment, says, sure. And he proceeds to clean all the shelves and fill the shelves with Scripture. And he hangs a picture of himself in the center of the room. Then they go on to the dining room. The dining room is the room of appetites and desires. And Jesus asks the man, he says, well, what's on the menu today? And the man replies, some of my favorite dishes, money, academic degrees, and stocks with newspaper articles of fame and fortune as side dishes. And Jesus didn't judge him, but Jesus also, he noticed, didn't eat anything that was presented to him. And so he asked him why, and Jesus told him that he had food that would truly satisfy, and told the man, stop trying to, to feed yourself on your own pleasures and do the will of God. And so the man did. And then they went to the living room. In the living room, the man learned simply to stop and spend time with Jesus every day. And then they went to the workbench in the workroom where Jesus helped the man learn how to have a fruitful life with fruit that would last and make a lasting impact. And then they went to the rec room where the man learned how to bring Jesus along even when he's spending time with his friends and in his hobbies. But lastly, they came to the hall closet. One day, the man came home and he found Jesus waiting at the door with what you could say was an arresting look in his eyes. As the man entered over the threshold, Jesus said to him, he said, there's a peculiar odor in the house. Something must be dead around here. It's upstairs. I think it's in the hall closet. Immediately, the man knew what Jesus was talking about. Inside that closet were one or two things that he didn't want anybody to know about. And especially in that moment, he did not want Jesus to know about. He knew they were dead and that they were left over from the old life. And it's interesting that the, the closer Jesus came to that closet door, the angrier the man became. He had already given Jesus access to the study, to the dining room, the living room, the work room, the rec room. And now Jesus is wanting access to the little two foot by four foot closet upstairs. The man refused to give Jesus the key. And Jesus again responded without love, or with love, but without judgment, that, okay, but I can't, me and the smell can't occupy the same space. Something in this scenario has to change. And so Jesus said, I'll just go outside and I'll stay on the porch. Get back to that in a little bit. Today we're continuing in that All In series we started last week, and we were looking all month, we're looking all month at Mark chapter 12, verses 30 through 31, in which Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Okay, that's important to keep that connection. He's asked by a teacher of the law, he said, what's the most important commandments in all the scripture? And basically Jesus goes and he summarizes the summary of the Old Testament, basically, and the Ten Commandments. He said in the Shema, the prayer from Deuteronomy 6, 5. He, he, he answers with this, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. He says the second commandment is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself, no commandment is greater, other commandment is greater than these. And we're going to, we were talking about this verse all month. Last week when we kicked off the series, we talked about the heart, and we talked about the Old Testament Hebrew word lev. Uh, which, you know, to the Old Testament Hebrews represented more than just the blood-pumping organ of the body. 
It actually represented the interior world of the person, everything that was happening inside, where we think, where we make sense of the world, where we feel emotion, where we make choices based on our desires. We've talked a lot about what, the, what, what Lev was. Well, today we turn our attention to the next word in that passage, and it's the word soul. What does it mean to love God with all our soul? Well, that Deuteronomy passage that Jesus quoted in Mark 12 uses this Hebrew word, nefesh, nefesh. It uses, that's the word that it uses for soul. We, our English translations translate it into the word soul, and it's actually that's a little bit uh, unfortunate, a little bit of a misleading uh, translation, because for us, on this, and from this stage in history, the word soul for us has a lot of Greek influence in it, and we oftentimes think of the word soul uh, as the non-material, immortal essence of a person. That's the way we understand the English word that we hear there. But that's not the best understanding of the word nefesh in the Hebrew. To the ancient Hebrews, the word nefesh was a reference to your entire physical existence. It was all of you. It was all of your living being. That's what they looked at it at, not this separate part. It wasn't kind of, you know, segmented down from there. So when Deuteronomy is talking about loving God with all your soul, what it's saying is it's talking about loving him with all of our physical being, all of our capabilities, all of our limitations, everything that we are. We don't have a nefesh. We are a nefesh. Of course, when Jesus quotes the Deuteronomy passage in the New Testament, Jesus, in his, in his time, is speaking in Greek. All right, So the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in, in Greek, and that's what was being spoken at the time, or at least what's being transcribed here for us. And so when Jesus uh, looks and he says, okay, there's that Old Testament passage uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, uses the word nefesh, we get to the New Testament time, the word that's chosen when he's trying to re-share that message, the Greek word he shares is the word psyche. He uses the word psyche. So to make sure everyone's following me here, in Jesus' mind, in Mark's mind as well, the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word nefesh is psyche. Okay? Psyche. And that's significant. All right, that's significant because Jesus uses that word in another teaching of his, a significant one, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. When Jesus says to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your, and the word there is psyche, if you try to hang on to your psyche, your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your psyche for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own? And the interesting thing he is here, that next word is psyche. It's not not a separate word. It's the same Greek word. Our English translations use two different words. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own psyche? Is anything worth more than your psyche? So everywhere we see the English words life and soul in that passage, it's actually the same word. Here's how it all ties together, okay? When Jesus calls us to love the Lord our God with all our soul, he's calling us to surrender every aspect of ourselves, the good, the bad, the ugly. He's calling on us to hand over the key to the closet that we refuse to let him into. He's calling us to let him use our history, our work, our relationships, our finances, our homes, our hobbies, our interests. He wants it all. He wants it all in submission to him and his will And if we will do so, what we find is that we actually gain a more complete psyche or a more complete nefesh than we had in the first place. And Jesus knows all about this himself. We gain more by giving over it all to God. He knows this. We look at another passage, Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. Matthew 21, verse 1, it says this. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you'll, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. This is the English Standard Version. 
The, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the, the donkey and the colt and put, them on their, or put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. What does that passage have to do with anything we just talked about? Here's what I love about this passage. I love this moment when Jesus is walking in to Jerusalem in the final week of his life. It's because Jesus knows everything that's about to happen to him. We go back earlier in the book of Matthew. We see that he's, he, knows, he knows everything that's going to transpire. He knows what he's walking into that final week of his life. And yet he still does it. He's ready to give everything. He loves God enough and he loves you and me enough that he's ready to do it all. We see Jesus walking through a lot of things that are daunting to us in this passage. We see as he trusts God, he's willingly walking into rejection. He's ready to sacrifice the acclaim and the awards and the notoriety and all of the, all of the, the trappings of, of being very popular. He's ready to, to sacrifice all of that. Most of the people laying these palm branches are likely fellow travelers from Galilee who have come to Jerusalem for the celebration of the Passover later in the week. As people from Galilee, where Jesus spent so much of his ministry, they are likely familiar with Jesus, with all the, the stories of, of the things he taught, the miracles he performed. Most recently, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. That happens right before he comes into this last week of his life. They may not have seen them all personally, but they knew the stories. And the idea of him coming into Jerusalem for the very festival that celebrates God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt has expectations going through the roof about what this is all about. So much so that it says the whole city of Jerusalem is being stirred up. And the word stirred there doesn't quite convey what's happening here. There's, a, there's another, here's another language thing. I know I'm laying a lot of language on you guys here today with Greek and stuff. But the original Greek word here that's used to talk about how stirred up they were is the same word that is used in Matthew 27, 51 to describe the earthquake that's going to rock Jerusalem that Friday when he dies. And it's also the same Greek word that's used in Revelation 6, 13 to describe what happens when the sixth seal is opened and the sun is blackened and the stars fall from the sky at the end of time. Ironically, it's, it's this uproar that for the time keeps the chief priests and the Pharisees from laying a hand on him. Matthew 21, 46 says, And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. The crowds did. There's all this energy, but it's built on assumptions about Jesus. It's built on the glittering image that they had. A lot of us will do everything we can to preserve people's glittering image of ourselves. Jesus said, you know what? That's all nothing compared to what God wants for me and what God wants for you ahead of us in heaven. It's better to do the will of God. And because their assumptions about him are going to be frustrated and disappointed, they're going to actually, in the end, these people who are laying these palm branches down at his feet are going to have more resentment toward him by the end of the week than appreciation. It takes a special kind of faith to walk headfirst into situations that you know will make you unpopular. There has to be something else above that to make us walk through that door, and that is how the, our love for God, our trust in him. Do we believe he'll be there for us? Do we believe the promise will be there for us in the end as well? Secondly, we see Jesus here willingly walking in humility. He trusts, he's trusting God, and he willingly walks in with humility. He's getting sort of a red carpet treatment in this passage as the people are laying their, their palm branches down in front of him and the cloaks on the road before him. The idea of a red carpet event goes all the way back to Greece. In the ancient play, Greek play Agamemnon, which was written in 480, or 458 B.C., the titular king Agamemnon has a red carpet pathway set out for him when he returns from the Trojan War. That didn't end too well for him in, in the play. See, red carpets were believed to be reserved for the gods at the time. They, did, they walked on them to avoid touching the ground that mortals did. And so the, this moment of hubris, when Agamemnon lays out that red carpet, he's basically saying, I am a god. Look at me like a god. 
And that moment of hubris confirmed that the gods would not spare him. Today, a red carpet ceremony is tied to prestigious events like the Oscars. And during the pre-award festivities, right, we see the hottest celebrities donning the latest fashion, making their big way into the big event, posing for pictures and taking interviews. And all this, all this hoopla takes place along this massive red carpet that stretches all the way to the entrance of the venue. In Matthew 21, by setting down their garments and leafy branches, the people are creating this sort of red carpet for Jesus. Such a scene was reminiscent of the victory parades of kings and generals in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13 reminds us of, of the procession for Jehu. They quickly carpeted the bare steps with their coats and blew a trumpet shouting, Jehu is king! But instead of an armed soldier in this, this instance, astride a war horse, the moment is met by a plain-clothed civilian riding a donkey in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O my people. Shout for, with joy, for look, your king is coming. He is the righteous one, the victor. Yet he is lowly, riding on a donkey's colt. Perhaps the Old Testament imagery isn't totally lost on the crowd, but the events that follow that week will show that they did not understand the full significance of this humble image. This is more than just a testimony that prophecy is being fulfilled. For Jesus, this is self-disclosure. It is a self-disclosure to the world. He's not entering Jerusalem to be made the king. He's entering Jerusalem as the king to make his final offensive against sin and to bring peace between God and humanity for all time. Yet he's content to simply let his actions speak for themselves and let an empty grave be his glory. There's a lot of submission to the will of God in this. Because that's not how we would do it. And would we be content to just let our actions speak for themselves? To just sit there and be content to know I'm doing the will of God? There's so much here that that he is laying at the feet of God because he loves the Lord. He's giving everything to him. And then lastly, trusting God, he willingly sacrificed himself. Walking into Jerusalem on that particular Sunday has a significance that many of us would have a hard time recognizing. That particular day was the 10th day of the month of the Passover. The 10th day of the month of the Passover. Did you follow me on that? (laughs) It was the 10th day of the month of the Passover, with the Passover itself arriving on the 14th day of the month, on that Thursday. The 10th day of the Passover was very significant. It was the day in the process of celebrating Passover that the Passover lamb was to be selected for the sacrifice according to Exodus 12. Jesus walks in with purpose on that day, and he walks in knowing that that day, that he is walking toward his death, and it's the only path to life. Death, in this case, for him, was the only path to life. So he tells his disciples what, he tell, what we read earlier. Matthew 16, 24 to 26, we'll read it again. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your psyche, you will lose it. But if you give up your psyche for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own psyche, your nefesh, the entirety of your life? Is anything worth more than your psyche? your soul. Here's what we end up finding about a lot of those people along the roadway, even about ourselves. As Michael Wilkins states, lots of people did shout for joy because they loved Jesus, but not all of them really cared for him above their own dreams. The people laid down their palm branches without laying down themselves, without laying down their nefesh. And so as Jesus challenges us to love God with all our soul, it's a challenge that as he did, we will lay down every part of who we are for God. Love God with every part of your life and being. Love God with everything that constitutes your life. The good, even in the bad and the ugly, give it all to him. I want to go back to that little short story that I shared at the beginning. I promised we'd get back to that. 
We left Christ sitting on the front porch of the man's house, refusing, the man refusing to hand Jesus the key to that little closet, the last space he wanted Jesus to touch, the little two-by-four closet of our lives that holds more darkness, pain, and regret than all the other rooms combined. And here's how the story concludes. When one comes to love and know Christ, the worst thing that can happen, Robert Boyd Munger says, is to sense him withdrawing his fellowship. The man said, I had to give in. I'll give you the key, he said sadly, but you will have to open the closet and clean it out. I haven't got the strength to do it. Just give me the key, Jesus said. Authorize me to take care of that closet, and I will. And with trembling fingers, the man passed the key to Jesus. Jesus took it, he walked over to the door, he opened it, entered, and he took out all the putrefying stuff that was rotting in there, and he threw it away. Then he cleaned the closet, and he painted it. It was done, the man said, in a moment's time. Oh, what victory and release to have that dead thing out of my life. And then he said, a thought came to me. Lord, is there any chance that you would just take over management of the whole house and operate it for me as you did that closet? And Jesus responded, I'd love to. That's what I want to do. It's what I wanted to do all along. You, you can't be a victorious Christian in your own strength. Let me do it through you and for you. But, he said, I'm just a guest. I have no authority to proceed since the property isn't mine. And then dropping to the man's knees, he said this, Lord, you have been a guest to this point, and I've been the host. From now on, I'm going to be the servant, and you're going to be the owner and the master. And running as fast as he could to the strong box, he took out the title deed to the house, describing all its assets and liabilities, locations and its situation. He eagerly signed the house over to Jesus for time and eternity. And the man says, things are different since Jesus has settled down and made his home in my heart. Are we willing to love the Lord our God with all our soul? It's possible to have been a church, a faithful church attender for years. It's possible to have even been an immersed believer who has been in the waters of baptism and still, in a way, in our life, be treating God like a guest in our lives and not as the owner. Have we fully transferred the title over to him with all its assets, all its liabilities, all its location and situation? That's what loving God with all our souls calls us to do. Let's pray. Father, today we encounter some challenging teaching. I, I know, Lord, uh, so often we, we, we hear that word soul and we think of you know, the part of us that lives forever after this life. And there's, there is, that, that, is, that is real. <laughs> that is real. But in this situation, Lord, in this passage, the, the meaning here is, is somewhat different. It, it's about the entirety of our person, the entirety of our living being. And sometimes, Lord, we look at our living being. I, I look at my life, Lord. There are parts of my life that I look at, and yes, I, I, I love and I enjoy those parts of my life. I enjoy the hobbies I have and the friendships I have. But if I'm being honest, Lord... There are parts of my life that, uh, that I'm ashamed of. There are parts of my life that, that, I, that I, 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 I want to keep to myself, and I, and I don't even want you to see, and I don't certainly want to follow you with those things because, Lord, to do so would mean great vulnerability on my part, and it would mean really having to trust you. And, Father, we struggle to remember how trustworthy you are, Maybe there are reasons for that. Maybe, Lord, in the past we've had a perception that we couldn't be trusted. Maybe something someone did to us, even wearing the name of Christ, we misinterpreted not as that person's actions, but as your actions. You did this to us, God. And really it wasn't you, that it was just another broken human being. 
who was trying in their own way to follow you imperfectly as we all do, and we just got the wires crossed. And now we're coming back to this realization, Lord, that you are trustworthy fully with the deepest parts of us. And if we will trust you with those things, the transformation in our life, the, the, the life, the experience that we have of Nefesh on the other side will be even greater than what we experience on this side of that decision. Father, may we give ourselves fully to you the way Jesus did. We love you and we give you the praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, if you've not done that, if you've not given yourself to Christ fully, I want to encourage you, for one, to start with giving your life to him, making him your savior. If you've not made that decision, you can come forward as we sing the song here in just a minute and make that choice to follow in the waters of immersion. Maybe as Christians, there's some of us out here today who say, you know what, I once answered that call, but I kind of need to answer that call again in a way, as far as just saying, you know what, I, need to, I, I haven't really been handing over the entire title to him. I've still been treating him as a guest in my life. And we need to change that. Whatever your decision is this morning, I pray that you will make that. Even if it's just sitting there in your, in your seat today, make that decision. Follow that challenge that God has put on your heart. Let's stand together and worship our God.
have a seat. Mike and Jenny, if you'll come forward. This is Mike and Jenny Conyers, and they've been worshiping with us for quite a few months now. Uh, and uh, they come forward as immersed believers in Christ to bring their membership to Northside Christian Church. And so we're excited to be able to welcome you all today uh, to our fellowship. If you would, I'll take your hands here, and if you'll repeat with me this great confession, we'll repeat it all together here today, on which Christ is building his church. We believe, we believe. that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And we believe, we believe that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Welcome you all. Good to have you all. <laughs> be sure, be sure following worship to greet them and welcome them to Northside, if you would. morning. So I, I like what uh, Nick said in his sermon, death for Jesus was the only way to life. That's very powerful. And Jesus said, I'm the, bread of, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So he's talking about spiritual hunger, not physical hunger. And if we go to him, our souls are going to be fed. And uh, Jesus' death also allows us to have eternal life. So his sacrifice, um, in his sacrifice, his death as a, as a person, uh, we get to go to heaven and be with him forever. So just remember that as you take the emblems today. God, uh, we thank you for uh, your sacrifice, and we, help you to rem- we, we, we ask you to help us remember that as we take communion today. And Lord, we... As, as we're remembering that, uh, we ask you to help us turn over the keys to those secret places in our lives and to let you in and let you take control. In your name we pray. Amen. It's just a coincidence, but every time I have communion meditation, I've got to do one of these financial updates. So come up, do my piece, sit down. Nick's like, hey, what's going on? So, um, so what I want to do is just update everybody on the finances. We 
<clears throat> wrapped up the capital campaign at the end of December, very successful. So uh, where are we today? So you can uh, advance the slides there. So this is what we've got. So these are our, you know, kind of our liquid assets that we have. So our cash and investments. So we have 826,000. So of that, about 700,000 is the building fund. So we pay the mortgage out of the building fund uh, as of right now because we don't get enough regular giving to pay that. So uh, what, we've, what we did was we were able to release that building fund, uh, the second line there, the 14 month CD. And so that was, that was something that was in escrow with the bank and we didn't have access to that. And so we worked this last year to be cash flow positive for the third straight year. And then the bank released that to us and I asked them to put that in a CD. And so we're earning four and a half percent on that money. So for 14 months. And then our money market account at the church, they offered to pay us instead of zero, like a lot of bank accounts pay, we're getting 4%, and that's 318,000. And then we still have some money at the Solomon Foundation, which was our original lender. And the payment is actually coming out of that money until it's gone, um, and we get 3% there. The playground fund is also in um, a money market account. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, and so if you could go to the next slide. So th this is what's in the future. So we'll have to refinance our loan in just under three years. Um, so, and at that time, we'll look at whether it's advantageous to stay with West Banco or to go to another bank. Um, they were the only bank that would finance us at the time in 2021, but hopefully we'll have some options. We've got a good track record now. And so the giving that we have, our regular giving still doesn't support the mortgage payment. So the goal is that over time to get more regular giving. So uh, I think it was in February, we got over a $30,000 building gift. Uh, we thank that person, very generous, and we were happy about that. But we want the regular giving of the church eventually to pay uh, the mortgage. So one of the things that we'll do this year is we're gonna make one payment out of the general fund, and that's gonna be this month. And so it's symbolic, um, but as we go, we wanna increase that over time to where 12 months of the payment comes out of the, the general fund. So in future years, uh, we'll increase that. And you know, with, with that said, we, we appreciate everybody's generosity and thank you for everything you, you've done uh, from a financial resource standpoint over the last year. Um, and I think that is it. But one, one thing I do wanna say, so um, is that the last uh, slide? It is, okay. Um, so the land sale, the three acres, that is progressing. So where the barn is, we own a little strip of land up there. We have an offer from a developer to buy that. They're gonna put that together with a bunch of other land and probably make a shopping center or something like that. And so we think that that is gonna happen here in the next maybe few months. Uh, so they're doing title work, they're doing survey work. And so that would be another 300,000. We'd have to put 65,000 of that down on the mortgage and then the rest we could go and invest in another CD. So that would give us uh, over a million dollars in, in uh, liquid assets. All right, so that's, that's it, thank you. Really what, I <clears throat> appreciate Rob sharing that. I uh, appreciate, you know, I know some of that's financial ease. Uh, it's a good thing it's on, it's on the, you know, the screen there to kind of give us a, a reference point. Appreciate. And honestly, God is so good. And a lot of that is because, you know, we, we follow, you know, that one of the areas we, we give over to God is, is our finances and things. Not only that we just have these assets, but remember what these assets represent. They represent the ability to do ministry. This place is full every week, every night. We have stuff happening through here, people's lives being impacted in our circles ministry, poverty alleviation ministry, our Celebrate Recovery ministry. We've even got people using this building for violin lessons and coming in and using the space. And the church, they're seeing a church that's welcoming with open arms. And, and a lot of the funds that even through our general fund go toward things like supporting our missionaries. There's a wall out there in the foyer. When you go outside, you'll see all the missions around the world that we support where we're bringing the hope of the gospel to people around the world. And so that's what this is really all about. This is all about giving people hope 
and bringing that hope to them and using those resources and this resource of this facility wisely in order to do that. A few other things I want to announce here, just to remind everybody about as we close, uh, as along the lines of what we've been talking about, there are ways in which we can be generous and ways we can give. There are offering boxes at the rear of the room, our online giving, our P.O. box, are all options. Also, though, and speaking of generosity, we're in need of Easter egg hunt donations. That's coming up in a couple of weeks, our Easter egg hunt on, on Palm Sunday. We need plastic eggs. And we need candy, and those can be dropped off in the blue buckets outside of kids' space. So if you'd like to donate, that's always a big treat for our kids every year. We appreciate everyone's donations for that. Also, this week, our gift group. GIFT stands for Growing in Fellowship Together. It's just a great group of people to get together, to get to know one another, and build relationships together within the church. The gift group is going to be meeting Thursday at El Azteca Mex Mexican Grill in Lexington at 6.30 p.m. This, this coming Thursday. So if you'd like to get to know other people, it's a great fellowship that happens every month as a way to get to, to know people. Uh, Deb Thompson coordinates that for us. Deb's in the back over here. You can see her if you have questions, and she'd be glad to share with you about the gift group. Also, coming up in a week, a week from this evening, is our family dinner, first ever family dinner in particular with the emphasis that we're going to be making uh, uh, this, this particular month. This new, it's a biannual event, actually, for all families, covering family conversations and the importance of dinner together to have them. Our first dinner is going to be, again, this coming Sunday at 5 p.m. in place of Awana and Switch. So there will be no Awana and Switch next week. We'll just have this family dinner uh, fellowship. So sign up. You can sign up for that. If you'd like to, you can see it on the screen. There's a QR code. You can sign up there. You can sign up. There's some information in the bulletin, I think, as well, where you can do that. Uh, and there's more information. And again, the, the QR sign up, they're also on the tables in the lobby. So you can take a QR code of those little, little, little uh, placard things on the tables in the lobby, and you can get that information and sign up for that event. With that, we need help if you're physically able after the service to help us pick up all the chairs in the room uh, so that we can be prepared for Awana tonight. If you can help us with that, we'd appreciate it. And uh, with that, Wayne, if you'll lead us in a closing word of prayer, let's stand together and go before the Lord once more as we just thank him for this time together. May God bless everybody throughout the coming week. Father, you are an awesome God. And Father, we thank you for the generosity of the people here at Northside. And we thank you that you have allowed us to build this facility to use as a tool to reach those in our community. Father, we thank you. You are gracious, you are generous. You continue to uphold this world with your mighty power. And Father, help us to tap into that power as we go into this coming week and share the love of Christ. Father, we love you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.